how did you first come to meet Alex Houston? I came to meet Alex Houston uh, in the mid 80s uh, when he was introduced to me because he had an idea to put a company together with the People's Republic of China, a joint venture company. And he knew I had State Department connections and he knew that I had business background, very successful, so he elected to make me the president of the company and we put this business together, a legitimate business manufacturing capacitor banks for the mining industry. Well, it was the Chinese that told me that Alex Houston was involved in all these nefarious acts, and they did show me hard proof. Okay, but you were approached by a Chinese intelligence officer who gave you this information. What did he tell you? The Chinese intelligence officer told me that Alex Houston was involved in child and adult pornography. He was involved in uh, drug running, and he was involved in money laundering for the Central Intelligence Agency, and it went all the way to the White House. Now, he alluded to that woman and her child that were in uh, Mr. Houston's charge, as he, I think his exact words were. He didn't say they were married. He didn't say that they were related or, or even anything else. He said that they were Alex Houston's charges, uh, I believe were the exact words. Okay, so you then returned to the U.S. and began to investigate the information you were given about Alex Houston. How did that process begin? After about a week, I think, of thinking about it, I went ahead and, and began to reconnect with some people who were still active within military intelligence. Um, two people I met in a restaurant in Clarksville, Tennessee, uh, that were attached to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. They were CIA. I met with them, and these men told me, basically, that what I had heard in China was most likely true, and that they didn't personally know Alex Houston, but they knew exactly what I was talking about, and that it, I had, in fact, bumped into something that I couldn't do anything about. I asked them if they could please steer me in the direction of someone who could help Kathy and her daughter break free mentally of their CIA mind control existence. They told me that they would look into it, but it was too risky in essence, that I need to look somewhere else. Why didn't I contact one of my other friends? And they had told me all they could tell me. It was at that point that I began to believe that there were plenty of good psychiatrists and psychologists, particularly the ones that have engaged in research and mind control that I knew of, like UCLA's Jolene West and others that I thought could be a possible help uh, in helping me get Kathy and her daughter into therapy because my intentions were to go back to China. I had, I had no intentions of, of staying in the United States. During this week period of time, um, I discovered that my bank accounts had been pilfered. So did you think that the action on your accounts was due to what you knew about Kathy and her daughter? At the time that, that my bank accounts were just suddenly disappearing, I had I had really, the only way I could do anything was to surmise that Kathy O'Brien might be the reason that my accounts disappeared because I knew about her. And I had inquired as to the validity of, of uh, the charges that that the Chinese had given me uh, about uh, Alex Houston and what he was doing. Okay, so now you're starting to believe that Kathy and her daughter are being kept under mind control by Alex Houston. Why didn't you just rescue them? Quite honestly, I didn't really know how to get her out of there. I didn't know how to trigger her out of her existence because I didn't know what her programs were. However, I did have one person who had worked in a capacity to where this individual did know codes, keys, and triggers. And he told me, he said, the most common trigger used by the CIA at that level on individuals, whether they be military or whether they be civilian, is the voice of God. And I said, what? And he said, use the voice of God. I said, what, is, what does God sound like? And he said, just call her on the telephone and tell her you're God. And I said, yeah, right. What else do I tell her? He said, I'll get back with you. He called me back in a number of hours and explained to me that I was to give her a, a Bible scripture. And that was Psalms 37, 37. Well, I had some knowledge of the Bible. I went and looked at that Bible scripture and it said, 
Mark the perfect man. I thought this is ludicrous. So I called her up as the voice of God and I told her to read Psalms 37, 37 and meet this man at the Burger King restaurant in Goodlettsville, Tennessee at such a time, on such a day, which was actually the following day. I went to the Burger King really not expecting to see this woman. She walks in with a plastic smile, great big eyes, and she comes in and she looks at me as though I'm from off the planet, and she said, God sent me to you. Did you were you able to discern from your past work that she was in a trance? There was no question. Um, and there was no question as to Kathy's mental condition at that time, because that was the first time that I'd had the opportunity to sit down with her one-on-one -on -one without anybody else being around and literally ask her uh, some questions in a literal mode and test her level of suggestibility and determine that she was indeed under someone else's mind-controlled influence. Now, who that person was, I, at that point in time, I did not know other than Alex Houston. So at this point, you orchestrated an intermediary rescue of Kathy and her daughter. Uh, what was Houston's reaction? He, I called him up, or he called me, I'm sorry. He, Alex Houston called me and said, he said, have you talked to Kathy? I said, no. I said, I really don't talk with Kathy. Um, he said, well, she's gone. I said, well, I, I wouldn't have any way of knowing. And he said, well, I, thought, I can't understand it. I mean, she's gone. She's taking my VCR. And at that point in time, I was just about to fall on the floor because I just lost $2 million and he's complaining about a VCR. And <laughs> I don't know why, it's still funny to this day. Um, he was complaining about all these little things that she took out of the house, which absolutely was nothing. She took nothing, uh, amounted to anything, um, except um, some medical equipment for her daughter and <laughs> his VCR. So what made you guys finally have to leave Tennessee? After uh, two or three months <clears throat> of, of taking care of my business and trying to get my money back and et cetera, et cetera, I ran into... To, um, Another problem, this same deputy called me up and told me the sheriff of my county wanted to see me. I went to see the sheriff and the sheriff told me, he said, Mark, I don't know what you're into. It has something to do with that woman that's in your house. I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, you know that we work very closely with the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He said, someone from the FBI in, Nash in the Nashville, Tennessee office came into this office and told me that you were scheduled for a hit by the CIA. I said, well, now that's their job to stop this. I said, CIA is not supposed to be operating on domestic soil, according to the Constitution. He said, Mark, I don't want to hear any of this. I want you to get out of my county. I want you to leave now. I don't care where you go. Just get out of my county. I said, well, I have a house here. I have property here. He said, sell it and leave. Give it away. Just leave it, abandon it, do whatever you need to do, but you're going to leave. I said, what are you threatening me? He said, no, I'm begging you, please leave. After leaving Tennessee, you went to find some of your old spook friends in Nevada, but they weren't much help. Talk about what you did after that. After, after being sorely disappointed in Nevada and told that I had just got on the back of the tiger, that was what they told me. They said, now you're on the back of the tiger. You're gonna ride that tiger until it falls, because if you get off, it'll eat you alive and there's nothing anybody can do. You have far, far outstepped your even common logic. I said, well, what should I do? They said, if I were you, I would go some remote place on this planet and act like you weren't ever coming back. Well, at that point in time, I came back and told Kathy, I said, I'm going to take you to the top of the world. Well, that meant that she would have an overview of all the bad people, but she wouldn't be exposed to them. She said, the top of the world, where is that? I said, it's far, far, far from here. It's in the cold, icy, frigid north. She said, well, I came from Michigan and it's cold, or something to that effect. And I said, well, you'll love this place. It's not as cold as Michigan, even though it's far, far north of it. She said, where? And I studied her face. And I realized that 
it was a very good chance that neither one was going to make it there alive. So I said, I'm taking you to Alaska. I used to work there. I know everybody, and there's only two ways in that place. Actually, there's three, air, sea, and one road. Everybody gets their picture taken. I thought, at least I've got some friends in the intelligence community will, that will dispose of whoever kills me after they do it. I was absolutely convinced that my chances of survival were one in a million at that point. I had nothing to lose. Everything in my life had been destroyed, it seemed like, overnight, even though it took months. So what was the process of you deprogramming her? The process of deprogramming is really the person, you don't deprogram anybody, the person deprograms himself. You establish that they're safe, uh, not only in reality, but in their mind. Um, you establish a trust bond between the two of you. In this case, it was um, absolute trust because she was seeing that I was um, had lost everything, that I had been a very successful businessman before, and all of a sudden nothing. Uh, I'm driving around in a pacer. Um, there's uh, any number of things that were, I mean, obvious to even somebody in her, her condition. So it took about nine months of her writing out her memories, and then me taking those memories, holding them three weeks, letting her look at them, and if they, she remembered them, fine. If she didn't remember them, actually I tossed them in the trash. Um, because in retrospect, I did the right thing. Okay, before we get any further, I just want you to explain the whole concept of harmonics and how Kathy was programmed using tones and then what you call uh, triggers. Everything on this planet vibrates at, at a different rate. Um, absolutely everything, even on a cellular level. What, what we're looking at here is the effect of, of changing that vibration at the brain stem. And once that's done, once that's understood, which is clearly understood now, um, we, can, we can begin to understand how to control the mind uh, of an individual externally by simply changing the vibration at the brainstem. Unfortunately, this is um, a very dangerous science because the brainstem can be damaged by combinations of harmonics. Kathy related to it as harmonic hell. And it was the sound, she claimed, of, of two rusty ships rubbing and scrubbing in the night. Well, I know this is a, when she described it, it was one of those things she could not possibly have known. Because I was sworn to secrecy not to ever divulge that information, even though it was just describing a tone. Well, um, every word that you and I are saying is a combination of tones. And if we learn how to control the modulation of those tones, we can actually affect someone's subconscious. And this has been known since the 40s. In the case of Kathy O'Brien, how would they create uh, triggers in her memory that would then help them in some uh, form of either sexual or espionage endeavor? Well, uh, quite easily, uh, because uh, you must remember that someone like Kathy O'Brien or anyone who is exposed to repetitious trauma prior to age five has an extraordinary high suggestibility level. They're very literal. Like um, she was telling me that she went into a place in the back of the White House that sir, it said, serve us entranced. And I'm going, that's absurd in my own mind, but I'm not saying anything to her. And then all of a sudden, while sitting and going over my notes, far away from her, I write it out and it says service entrance. That is the literal mind. She was told this is serve us entranced. So the next step, of course, was to see if she could remember or write out the name or person or persons who was re were responsible for delivering that message. Because what that actually did act as a trigger. Because she had been pre-programmed with the word entranced and serve us. Okay? In serve us of her country. It's the way she was taught. What was your reaction to her when she started talking about major, like the president? What, what you? Well, my, my reaction to Kathy's first information was, in spite of all that had happened, was disbelief. First of all, I had never been exposed to the phenomena of pedophilia or adults having sex with children. It didn't equate in my mind. I knew that it was obvious, and I had studied all the Himmler stuff, and I knew that it existed, but I didn't relate to it. And to be naming top people in Washington all the way to the presidency, including George Bush, 
um, I, I had a great deal of difficulty because I met George Bush and I, 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 I knew a lot of these people. I thank God didn't know Bird. Um, however, I did know a lot of the people she was mentioning. Um, not personally, uh, but I had met them at parties or had been inaugurations or, or whatever. Uh, and, and more or less in my mind, I had uh, had an acquaintance with them. So you were sh so you were shocked. I was shocked. I was I was I was in a state of shock that I could not relate to what she was saying, nor could I believe that it was all true. I thought it might be some screen memory or something that was planted memory to destroy her credibility. And at that point in time, the only proofs that I had was on Alex Houston and some operations with NASA and some uh, events that were very specific to her victimization uh, that occurred in the state of Alabama and Tennessee and in Michigan. That's all I had. What did you do with the stuff that you thought was provable? I took, I took those memories that she had recovered and the details, the maps, the, everything that she handed me, and I turned it over to people that I knew in, within federal law enforcement, not FBI, federal law enforcement, and I'll tell you one of them was Customs. Uh, <laughs> I turned it over to them and they in turn provided me with enough substantiation and proofs that I could prosecute. But nowhere at any time did anybody tell me that what she was recovering as far as memory goes on George Bush or any of these other things could have any plausible reality. So I really didn't focus on those at that time. It wasn't until after we got back that I had an opportunity to reconnect with some of my former associates and people within the intelligence community and validate the fact that some of these people are engaged in those atrocious things. Now where was Kelly at this point? While we were in Alaska uh, and Kelly was safe, she started beginning to have memory flashes and she went into respiratory failure. So we took her to Humana Hospital. And the diagnosis there, they could not find any biological reason for her respiratory failure. So they brought in a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist was state appointed. The psychiatrist had seen many mind control cases because of the Air Force Base up there and because of you know espionage being launched out of Anchorage in that area for years. Um, when this doctor, uh, Patrick was her name, a psychiatrist for the state, evaluated Kelly. She wrote in Kelly's uh, medical documents, as published in the book, that Kelly was a victim of mind control. That was the first time anyone had validated that on paper that was not connected to us or anybody that I knew, and she reported in that further uh, reported in that medical statement that Kathy had been a victim and that she was in the process of recovering from a dissociative identity disorder. Now Kathy had never been phys uh, officially diagnosed because if she had been officially diagnosed at that point in time she could never have appeared in court. So I never allowed her to have official diagnosis. Uh, it was a safety factor, a legal thing. So now what happened with Kelly? Well, Kelly went into the hospital and she never came out. Just to go back for a minute, uh, Kelly was suffering from respiratory failure due to her programming. Can you just explain how it was used to keep her away from Kathy? The programming, again, was, uh, again, the same as Kathy's, except Kathy's was digestive, Kelly's was respiratory. And respiratory is the most common uh, programming used to kill spies uh, who are captured. So what, how, did, how did the programming play out with Kelly? How did they use it against Kelly? Uh, Kelly went into what is known as an asthmatic attack. She doesn't actually have asthma, but she would go into a complete asthmatic attack, turn blue, stop breathing, and she'd have to be rushed into the hospital after just a few minutes in her mother's company. So it, it became so horrible uh, for Kathy because she loves her daughter and she wanted to help her and she wanted to give her comfort because her daughter had already been through hell all her life and then now she's in, in, being raised in an institution. Not even one institution, you've been bounced around all over the place. Explain what happened when you guys returned to Tennessee and tried to regain custody of Kelly. So the state of Tennessee, when they took custody of Kelly, when she'd been transferred from, from the Kentucky facility, uh, we began to f fight our case. And when we brought our evidences in to the court, Kathy was charged $2 million in child support. 
um, this was quite a surprise, but not a surprise. We knew that they were going to use this to keep Kathy away from her daughter because they knew Kathy would have to flee. She couldn't have to pay $2 million or go to jail. Well, the district attorney happened to be someone of extraordinary ethics uh, for, for that particular court. And he stood up and he said, Your Honor, you're violating every law that I know of. And, and the judge said in open court, laws do not apply in this case for reasons of national security. He said it in front of court watchers. He said it in front of, of about eight or nine lawyers, um, in addition to um, people that who knows who they were. They were sitting in the courtroom. And what's the significance of... The so significance of it is simply this. That judge, in essence, saved our lives because he, he absolutely said publicly that the, that the United States government was responsible for covering up this case. And even though he didn't have to state why and we weren't allowed to present our evidences, we knew at that point in time that we could not prosecute our case in any state, federal, um, uh, criminal or civil court. Um, the 1947 National Security Act I had worked under for years. I knew exactly every tenant in it. So um, I told Kathy when she was crying and crying, when she left the courtroom, she said, there is no justice. I said, you just got the greatest form of justice that I know of. And I'm still, my ears are ringing with what that judge said. How do you define justice in this case? Has it been granted? And what's the, what's, what are you guys going to The for? only justice that Kathy and I have been able to see is our ability to exercise our First Amendment rights. Since that judge invoked the National Security Act in open court, it allowed us to self-publish our book, which was in essence not even a book, and it, I still don't call it a book. It's a documentary of what happened to Kathy that we can prove, and what happened to Kelly that we can prove, and what happened to me after I rescued him. Have people outside of your circle of friends uh, been given copies of the book? Every person in Washington, we sent over 1,100 certified uh, mailings well before the book was ever published of the contents in Transformation of America. Um, that was done over a two-year period of time, a three-year period of time, from 91 to 94. In 95, we thought we were going to be able to address the House Intelligence uh, Select Committee on uh, Intelligence Oversight. It was in April of 95 when we were turned down the last time. Our lawyer, who's a federal lawyer, advised us on good advice to take that uh, portion of, of the documentation that we had, which was ex quite extensive and we actually sent to Washington to well over a uh, thousand people uh, in both houses of Congress within the Pentagon. I mean, every single one. The reason that they're in, mentioned in that book is because I didn't want anybody coming back and say, well, if you just contacted me, we could have fixed this. But no, you just broke this law, this law, this law. I said, Kathy, we're not going to leave any stone unturned. So we sent them out.